geographers in the room. <coughs> well, that's good news. Geography is the one subject I cannot resist being prejudiced against. <laughs> but one should be careful about one's prejudices. Uh, if I had done a little bit more geography, I would have understood that when uh, Tim told me that the quickest way to get from my home in South London to get to the airport was via Cambridge, uh, I wouldn't be standing here speaking to you today. Some lectures are presumptuous enough to try and be the last word on something. What I want to do this morning in the first session together is give you what is very much the first word on something. I want to just chuck out a series of provocations to get you thinking about how the uh, Christian story comes up against other stories that are told in modern culture today. Uh, despite uh, teaching at the wrong university, Tolkien had some great ideas <laughs> and had some throwaway comments that are worth thinking about. Tolkien said, mythology is language, and language is mythology. What Tolkien meant was that the stories a society tells about what it means to be human, what counts as human success, and what the world is like, decisively shape the very words and phrases that people use to communicate, and so determine the possibilities of what can be thought. And myths become more, not less, powerful when they become invisible. Once a story has been told so many times that we take its truth for granted, the story becomes part of the very conditions for thinking and communicating. It's often said about heresies that heresies are exaggerated truths. Ideologies are distorted loves. The narratives of modernity are mistaken reactions to how things appear to be or misdirections of genuine longings of the human heart. Their power and plausibility derive from the fact that they pull us towards something we think we want, overstating its power to give meaning and significance to our lives. So what I want to do this morning is just throw out a few of those myths that seem to me to be significant in modern culture and just begin to interrogate them in the light of the Christian story. The first myth is the myth of reason. The German Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant wrote a book in 1793 called Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone. The book was a manifesto for Kant's life's work to explore just how far reason could get in understanding what human beings are, what counts as human success, and what the world is like. Now Kant was not so naive as to think that reason alone could answer all those questions completely. But he did think he could get a long way down the track employing reason alone. Now what Kant does is to divide knowledge, and uh, epistemologists amongst you will have to forgive me for not unpacking that term and using it imprecisely. But he divides knowledge into two types. The things we can know through reason alone and the things that we can only take on trust through faith. Now, it's important to note two things about Kant's picture. First, the dividing line between reason and faith is an absolute one. So whereas older pictures would have said you have reason at one end of the spectrum and faith at the other end of the spectrum, and they're always involved, both of them to some extent in any knowing. He has no, on the left hand there's reason, and on the right hand that there is faith. So faith and reason stop working together to give us epistemological access to truths about ourselves and about the world. This, so Kant leaves us with a world, realm of knowledge without faith and a realm of knowledge beyond reason. Now the second thing to note about Kant's picture is that the boundary between the things we can know by reason and the things we only have access to by faith is decided by reason. Hence the title, Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone. Reason is what dominates the field of knowledge. Religion is left as the residue of once reason is run out. Now Kant's story about the relationship between religion and reason has become part of the air we breathe in Western society. Religion is reduced to the level of supporting a football team. In public, reason alone applies. 
Religion can have absolutely nothing to say about how the public institutions of our society operate because reason alone is sufficient and religion is, by definition, irrational. Religion is to be kept private because my faith is as irrational as my belief that Queen's Park Rangers are a football team worth supporting. And so my love for Queen's Park Rangers and my love for Christ can be tolerated just so long as they are hobbies I practice in private and with my fellow enthusiasts. Now, in the humanities, the belief in rationalism died around the time of the Second World War, if not before. I've stood in the death camp of Auschwitz and have seen what happens when the techniques of industrialization are applied to the science of genocide. I've watched the black and white pictures of the atomic bombs being dropped on Japan and seen what can happen when methods of warfare are judged solely by the criteria of efficiency, without regard to the distinction between combatant and non-combatant. I've seen the Berlin Wall fall, the end of a 72-year experiment into the application of methods of bureaucratic efficiency and rationality to the whole of society. So for the humanities, the lessons of those events are that human reason can be twisted to provide justification for just about any end whatsoever. As Alistair McIntyre so brilliantly identifies in his book, Whose Justice, Which Rationality? Different world views have their own criteria of reasonableness, not vice versa. The trouble is, uh, nobody pointed out uh, what Kant was teaching and what the Second World War revealed to the new atheists. Rationalism is overconfidence in God's great gift of reason to human beings. But Christianity has always stood for rationality. If you read the um, Essex Serpent, recent best-selling book, and what is interesting about that book is that the author captures the way in which, when this whale is washed up on the beach, it is both the atheist heroine and the Christian vicar who stand against superstition. Both of them want to put this strange, unusual event into its proper place. It was Christianity that freed people from sacrificing to the gods of the woods and the water. And James Hannan's great book on how Christian thinkers created the intellectual world within which the revolutions of Copernicus and Newton were possible is called God's Philosophers, how the medieval world laid the foundation for modern science. You see, if you believe, as pagan Europeans did, that the world is full of competing gods and spirits, the thing to spend your time doing is to appease them. If you believe, as Christianity taught in Europe, that the world is the creation of a good and loving God. Then you have reason to believe that goodness and order exist in the world and are open in principle to human discovery. So, that's the first myth chucked up in the air, the myth of reason. The second myths are twinned, the myths of evolution and progress. Now, I don't want to get into a discussion this morning about whether Christian biologists should be creationists, supporters of intelligent design, or theistic evolutionists. I do, however, want to uh, highlight how the ideas of evolution and progress function as myths within modernity. So evolution is an inductive hypothesis based on observations of adaptive behaviour in the short term, most famously Charles Darwin looking at finches in the Galapagos. But an inductive hypothesis based on that of how different species, indeed how different branches of the tree of life, could have derived from a single source. Evolutionism is a position which combines evolution with naturalism. So whereas evolution is a hypothesis of how different species came to be differentiated, evolutionism purports to explain why such differentiation occurred. Now, the problem with evolutionism is that evolution is blind to a large extent. Evolutionism imagines a world in which species compete for space and in which only survival counts as success. 
So beauty has no place other than as a means of surviving. Excellence has no meaning other than either being able to thrive in a wide variety of environments or being able to exploit a particular niche better than other species. And if survival is the only aim of the game, then whether the only species alive on the planet are blue, green, and algae, or whether the world contains something as majestic as a blue whale, is irrelevant. Life is happening, <coughs> something is surviving. There we go. But the problems with evolutionism run even more deeply. If evolutionism is true, then we have no reason to think of ourselves as selves at all. Just outside the train station I came from this morning is the Francis Crick Institute, uh, recently opened to provide cutting edge science based on uh, and named after one of the great discoveries <coughs> of the molecular structure of DNA. But this is the worldview out of which Francis Crick is operating. In his book in 1994, The Astonishing Hypothesis, he says, you, your joys and sorrows, your memories and ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. As Lewis Carroll's Alice might have said, you're nothing but a pack of neurons. <coughs> so if illusionism is true, there's no self to express, there's no mind operating as a source of consciousness. All that is occurring within my brain is the reception of data and the generation of responses by a pack of neurons whose switches flip off and on. As Peter Jackson has the orc bog say in the second Hobbit film, <coughs> and as Jesus heard a demon-possessed man say, I am legion. Human identity is dissolved and human being disintegrates in the face of such an analysis. There is no me other than in the trivial sense of a collective noun for that bundle of appetites whose only unifying characteristic is that they arise, flourish, complete, and decline within a particular body. An attractive vision? The atheist philosopher <laughs> Thomas Nagel did not think so. He wrote a book called Mind and Cosmos, why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. And in that book, Nagel argues that life, mind, consciousness, intentionality and values are all features of the world which evolutionism cannot explain. What he says is not only does the naturalistic framework have no current explanations for these fundamental features of the world as we experience it and as it really is, there is every reason to believe that the failures of naturalism to explain these things are so total that there is no prospect of a plausible theory being developed from within the current paradigm. So if evolutionism is there in the sciences, in the humanities, the functional equivalent of evolution is the myth of progress. Uh, once upon a time, in a more optimistic political era, the New Labour Party, remember them, uh, was set to power in 1997 with a campaign song by D. Ream, Things Can Only Get Better. <laughs> Special prize for knowing that the keyboardist in DV was Professor Brian Cox. The great achievements of the Victorian era were driven by the conviction that things can only get better. It was humanity's destiny, or at least the white man's destiny first, to overcome the issues of poor health, poor climate, poor education, poor housing through a series of inventions and reforms. Now, it might be thought that evolutionism supports the idea of progress, <coughs> that just because we are products of mindless evolution, we can now master it, direct it, and shape ourselves as we want. This is one of the claims that Dawkins makes. But that claim presumes that we have minds and that we are masters of these. And if we're nothing but a pack of neurons, evolutionism actually gives us, as Nagel points out, no reason for either 
conclusion. Why should a world in which evolutionism is true contain within it the potential for the long-term flourishing of the human race? <coughs> in a world which is already seen, according to the Eden Project, not just the extinction of the dinosaurs, but four other mass extinction events. Why shouldn't the world be one in which human beings are racing towards their own Ragnarok? See, without a belief in God, the myth of progress really is the opium for the masses. And when the belief in progress dies, well, the masses turn to real opium instead. <coughs> so, the myth of reason, the myth of evolutionism and progress. Bear in mind what I said at the beginning. I'm not saying that these uh, ideas are wholly false. The reason why they capture our culture is because they contain an element of truth, but they mistake the part for the whole. They go beyond their proper limitations and claim to provide total explanations. So here's the third myth. George Orwell famously commented on the equality promised by communism. All animals are equal, and some are more equal than others. In the 20th and 21st century, equality has been a powerful rallying, rallying cry, driving the suffragette movement, the civil rights movement, and the gay rights movement, amongst others. Now, the new ideas that many others in the West uh, naively assume that the equality of all human beings is self-evident. The myth is so taken for granted, the idea is so taken for granted, if you want to justify anything, one of the most powerful levers that you have is to claim that X is equal to Y, or that X is equal to bananas, or whatever kind of comparison you want to make. But in his book, Atheist Delusions, David Bentley Hart draws attention to just how radical the Christian belief of the equality of all human beings was. In the ancient world, it was taken as self-evident that slaves were worth less than those who were freeborn, that men were worth more than women, that adults were worth more than children, and within the Roman world, that Romans were worth more than barbarians. To take an example of where such beliefs persist today, consider the caste system. The caste system in India is based on an interpretation of Hindu texts and of the law code of Manu in particular. And it's a theory according to which different levels of society were created out of different parts of Brahma. The priest from his head, then the warrior caste, then the trader caste, and finally from his feet, the servant caste. And that leaves the lowest caste of society, the Dalek, the untouchables, who were not created from the body of Brahma at all. Now, if that's your myth, then the inequality of human beings is the thing that is obvious. So why does the West take the equality of all human beings so seriously? Two reasons. First, Judaism and Christianity affirm that all human beings, male and female, black and white, rich and poor, educated at Cambridge or unfortunate enough to be educated in another place, are equal, made in the <coughs> image of God. Completely different story about the origins of humanity. Secondly, Christianity backs that up with the example of Jesus. We're in Michaelmas term, heading towards Christmas, which always comes early in Cambridge. And we're going to celebrate the extraordinary story of God, born as a baby, not in a palace, but into poverty, in a nation under foreign occupation, forced as a child to leave his homeland as a refugee, a displaced person, returning home and working as a manual worker, living a travelling lifestyle as a homeless preacher, making a point in his ministry of associating with women, even prostitutes, half-castes, foreigners, suffering a criminal's death by being executed naked. 
He wanted God to come and demonstrate the fundamental equality of all human beings. Jesus does it in the most dramatic way possible by identifying with all those categories of person that we are likely to see as less worthy or worth less. The refugee, the homeless, the man work of the criminal, the slave. And he does that in his life and in his birth and in his ministry and in his death. Now, the basic equality of all human beings is extraordinarily difficult to defend on any atheistic basis. If there's no God, why should we think there is anything special about the human species as such? Well, if you're not going to affirm that human beings are made in the image of God and loved uh, by Christ, you might have to reach for capabilities and say that human beings have some capabilities that make them worth uh, protecting. Now that involves reading some evaluation into evolutionism, but so be it. But if you take a capabilities approach, then you define the class of those who have the capabilities. And you've really got two choices. You either define it in a way that some members of the human species don't fall within the class. They've got Alzheimer's, they're in a long time in coma, they are severely disabled, they haven't yet been born, and therefore they don't fall within the class. Now, if you don't like that option, um, just lower <coughs> the capability boundary. Uh, but if you do that, you're going to face arguments that at least some dolphins possess the same capabilities. So Peter Singer and others campaigned for basic legal rights to be extended to gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and orangutans. In uh, the USA in 2013, the Non-Human Rights Project filed a court action seeking the release of four chimpanzees because it said they displayed the necessary capabilities to be recognized as legal persons. Now oh, I find that frustrating, mainly because I love Gibbons, and Gibbons are the other eight, and they just seem to have been excluded on the basis of their size. <laughs> but the narrative of equality is very, very powerful, and yet we are going to run in the 21st century into a situation in which the questions about whether all human beings really are and the questions about whether human beings really are made in the image of God are going to be tested as never before, as technology and cyborgization and all sorts of other things come on to the agenda. Now, that myth of equality leads into an ideology of choice, whose wellspring is the ideas of the American revolutionary uh, Thomas Paine. For Paine, to be human is to have equal rights to everyone else. And therefore, success as a human being is demonstrated by exercising one's equal rights in ways which lead to the maximum satisfaction of one's choices. Equality and evolutionism brought together. Survival of the person who can maximize the fulfillment of their choices. And so that leads us on to our fourth myth, the myth of self-actualization. The American Christian philosopher Jamie Smith returns to Tolkien's point about the link between stories and language. <coughs> he says the West has inhaled philosophy without knowing it. There's philosophy in every Disney film, in every pop song, in every book. They are all telling us something about what it means to be human, what it means to succeed as a human being, and what the world is like. Now, Sarah Bakewell, in her book, The Existentialist Cafe, looks at one type of philosophy which became extremely influential in the 20th century. The philosophy of existentialism. Now, existentialism tells us, first, that there is no meaning in the world other than the meaning we create for ourselves. Second, 
Human beings are therefore dis destined to create meaning despite the absurdity and futility of the world. If evolution is blind, it's up to us to define what counts as progress. And existentialism says that we have the burden of doing that. Success as a human being is therefore creating and living in accordance with meanings which are true to oneself. The aim is what Heidegger called the same, authenticity. Now, existentialism was spread through stories, through the novels of Albert Camus, but more effectively through films like The Seventh Seal or Groundhog Day, even. And Bacon says that existentialism succeeded in becoming invisible. Its basic suppositions have succeeded in becoming taken for granted. Now, Jamie Smith describes it as a bourgeois philosophy for those with the luxury to pretend that this is all that there is. It's certainly an attractive philosophy for a cafe culture, whether in 1960s <coughs> Paris or 21st century Cambridge, which believes that it has outgrown God. You see, the act of buying a coffee in Starbucks is the epitome of an existentialist act. My choices, cappuccino, latte, flat white, skinny, soya, almond milk, cinnamon, chocolate, nutmeg, express my individuality, resulting in a coffee of my chosen size and flavour. And this goes on and on and on. I was told the best place to get coffee in Cambridge was Bolden Co, so I went there this morning, and they have a coffee called The Magic which was new to me. Endless <laughs> possibilities. And yet, the expression of my individuality in any city around the world is delivered to me by the employees and franchisees of a corporation which has gone to enormous lengths to ensure that as the stereophonics say, only the accents change. What is delivered to me is completely homogenized so that I get my choice of just how I like it. Because just how I like it is the only thing that gives my particular choice of an almond skinny cap uh, significance and meaning. You see, the truth in existentialism is that we all long for significance. We all long to matter in a way that is unique and irreplaceable. But if the fact I chose something is the only thing that gives it value, then value is nothing but a matter of taste. And if there's no value other than choice, then there's no such thing as truth. What is true, what is good, what is beautiful are no longer things that exist objectively out there in reality. All there are are things that are true for me, things I think will be good for me, and the things I regard as beautiful. Now watch how our society is managing to hold together two things that are completely <coughs> inconsistent. The humanities are dominated by the assertion that free will is absolute and must be prioritised at all costs. Whereas naturalism in the hard sciences says free will is an epiphenomenon. It's an illusion which deludes us into thinking that there is a conscious self whose responses to stimuli are not predetermined reflexes adapted to ensure the survival of our genes. Well, if naturalism in the hard sciences is right, well, we are amusing whatever our souls are to death. It's all a wonderful play out. And somewhere the hard scientists with their naturalism of the Illuminati is who dare tell us openly because we would collapse into the despair <coughs> against which the existentialists sought to protect us. Let me move to the fifth myth, which is a myth, I think, of a different kind, less prevalent, I think, in um, <coughs> the uh, academy, but I think very important in terms of the culture as it has developed. <coughs> now, I wonder if it's a myth that's been uh, about to die. And I'd be interested in your views on this. The myth is this. All you need is love. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> From the half century beginning in the 1960s, one of the dominant cultural messages has been, all you need is love. 
And that cultural reference was to love of a particular kind. It was to romantic love. It was to finding the one and then living happily ever after. And from Disney films to Gavin and Stacey, fulfillment was to be found in the sort of feeling that would leave you weak at the knees. <coughs> Now, as the divorce rate has climbed and the amount of sex people are having has actually decreased, uh, the plausibility of the story has declined. Romantic love has become something accessible only to a lucky few. Most of us can expect to end up like Bridget Jones. By the way, Bridget Jones in the books, not the film. So in the films, the three Bridget Jones films, she still ends up with Mr. Darcy. But in the books, she ends up alone with just her memories of the one that got away. Now, old age can bring clarity about what is really important. I'm looking forward to that. Um, the Apostle John, in his old age, wanted his readers to know, above all else, that God is love. That's 1 John 4, 8. But the truth that God is love cannot be disentangled from the truth that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <coughs> As Augustine expressed it, the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, the Holy Spirit is the bond of love between the two. Love is intrinsic to the eternal life of God. Love is the motive power that brought creation into being. The love of God in Christ for creation lies at the centre of the universe and its history. Bible affirms the importance of love, describes the love between Christ and the church in terms of the passionate, overwhelming, all-embracing love that a husband feels to his bride at the moment of their wedding, Matthew 22 and Revelation 19. But the Bible always places great emphasis on the constancy of God's love. The Father always loves the Son. We, as God's children, are always loved no matter how prodigal we are. Ruth's lifelong commitment to Naomi, her mother-in-law, is commended to us as an example of how we, like God, are supposed to invest ourselves in other people and to be committed to their welfare in the long term. Whereas the 60s reduced love to this one idea of romantic love and that of a particular type that only a lucky few were supposed to be able to enjoy. Christianity affirms that love is for everyone, that love is forever, and encourages us to be the sort of people in all our relationships, romantic or not, who can be depended on to be pursuing the good of other people through thick and thin. Now, I said this lecture was a start and not an end. I'm sure that you can now, once you start thinking like this, open up and reflect on all the other sorts of myths that are out there, that are dominant in uh, the, your conversations with your friends, in the thinking of your teachers, in the books that you read, uh, as you look, and the theories that are propounded. We do think in stories, and we think in pictures to a large extent. And Christianity has the greatest story of all. A meta-narrative, a big picture story, a theory of everything. Beginning with creation, taking account of the fall, weaving in the stories of providence and redemption and offering a future hope. And I want to just tease out a bit more how that compares and contrasts to those stories that we have been thinking about before. So I've already said, creation tells us that human beings are made in the image of God, all of them, men and women, black, white, and other ethnicities, rich and poor. Implication. The world is there for human beings <laughs> to explore and to nurture. Christianity has always stood against the heretics who say that the world must have been created by the devil or some sort of sub-creator. It affirms the goodness of creation. We see that repeatedly in Genesis chapter 1. Now there are two ways of understanding goodness. 
We might think of it, and sometimes people have thought of it, is it's the world kind of made and fully formed like a set of Lego where the <laughs> design's already been done. That isn't really the picture, I think, that the Genesis wants to offer us. What Genesis wants to offer us is the picture of the world as the box of Lego that you get on Christmas morning, where you've got all the pieces to be able to make the thing on the box that you need to apply effort and explore and see how they develop. God has made a world for human beings to investigate because he knows that we like doing investigation. And there are particular sorts of investigation that you in this room as scholars will want to be doing. Because the world is made by one God, the world is orderly. Two things are explored. One is that our universe is as orderly as it is. And the second thing is that we, as creatures, are able to understand quite so much about it. Einstein was amazed about the idea that he could get such a handle on what he called God's thoughts. When you kind of break it down and think about your neurons and that flabby bit of white, uh, pink uh, stuff inside the head of some overdeveloped ape. But there's a mysterious beauty to the world. In 1999, I saw a total eclipse of the sun over Cornwall. And on BBC television, they kept talking about the coincidence that the sun is 400 times the size of the moon, but also 400 times further away from the Earth. Only one planet in the entire solar system where the relationship between the moon, its moons and the sun is such that you can see a total eclipse. If you could stand on the surface of Venus, you wouldn't be able to see one. If you could stand on the surface of Jupiter, you wouldn't be able to see one. The only place you're able to do that is here. The doctrine of creation tells us the world was created orderly and good, that human beings are made in the image of God, and that human success in scholarship can consist in discovering the order within creation and putting that knowledge to use, to nurture and care for ourselves and our planet. Because Genesis gives us in Genesis 1, 26 and 28 the cultural mandate. Not a license to exploit the world without regard for biodiversity or the integrity of the environment, but a responsibility to care for the planet that we are on. Uh, bottom right, uh, we have a manuscript from St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. And if you look carefully, you can see on there uh, not one set of writing, but two. Uh, this manuscript was written on vellum, it was written on calf uh, skin, so very, very durable in the dry desert climate. And somebody wrote a shopping list in about 600 AD uh, on it. And then 400 later, some, somebody was looking for a piece of paper and reached for this and wrote the new text over the top. We've got two stories, two texts going on on the same thing. This is called a palimpsest, and it's quite a good image for how creation and the fall present us with two different stories. There's a story of the original goodness of God's purpose for the world. <laughs> and then over the top there's a story of violence and the mess of human sin and selfishness. And it's not that two stories kind of fit neatly together, they don't, they rub up against each other and collide at various points. So we can look at the world and think about, well, what does it mean for our world to be the world that God has made good? And we can look at the world and think, what does it mean for our world to be the world that is full of sin and violence? What are the implications of the doctrine of the fall? First, there is work to be done. The Christian doctrine of the fall tells us the world is broken and disaster and violence are to be expected. But the doctrine of the fall also tells us what human success looks like. Human success looks like working to mitigate and to contain the effects of the fall. Now, we don't need to overdo it here. Genesis 3, 23 and 24 
tell us that the Lord God has even banished humanity from the Garden of Eden and has placed angels and a flaming sword outside to guard the way to the tree of life. What is that supposed to tell us? It is supposed to tell us that there is no way back to Eden. We're not trying to get back to the garden as the 1960s hippie song sang. We are supposed to be going forward through redemption towards heaven. You see, the 20th century was the century of revolutions, of theories which asserted that human selfishness was solely or principally the result of social conditioning, and that if only radical political reforms were implemented, an earthly paradise would be built. What's the track record of such revolutions look like? A trail of bloodshed, often leaving their subjects worse off than before. So there's work to be done, mitigating the effects of the fall. But another implication is that the fall also affects us, even if we think we are working to mitigate its effects. You see, when I was a child and um, playing with soldiers was still allowed, you know, one of those games I used to play was goodies and baddies. And we like goodies and baddies. It's easy, isn't it, to sort the world into people who think like us and them over there. The Bible is against identity politics. <coughs> The Apostle Paul addresses this in the book of Romans. He looks at the Jews and the Gentiles and concludes, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the Bible also frequently reminds us that individuals outside the community of faith may be saying or acting in ways that God wants more than we are. Think of Melchizedek's interaction with Abraham, Balaam's prophecies to the Israelites, the Emperor Cyrus's treatment of the Jews, or Jesus telling a parable in which he deliberately chose a despised Samaritan as the hero. How would he tell that today? Would it be the story of the good Muslim? I think Christianity is pretty clear that while we can expect to progress in virtue to become more Christ-like, we can never achieve perfection in this life. Christians should always be realistic about the extent to which our efforts, even our best ones, are compromised by fallenness, finitude, and failure. But we're also warned by the fall about the uh, temptation to overreach ourselves. The story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 highlights the almost limitless possibilities of what human beings can achieve, but also the dangers of human pride and overconfidence. When Gordon Brown was Chancellor of the Exchequer, he announced the new Labour government had solved the problem of the economic cycle. <laughs> <laughs> a few years later, the Western world collapsed into the greatest recession of a half a century. Predictions of the end of economic history were exposed as hubris. So we have creation and the fall. We then have providence, God's common grace. God has not abandoned the world. Christianity is not a deistic religion which thinks that God designed the world like a clockmaker and then said, right, that's done, I'll go and put my feet up. God continues to be active in the world. It's ordered to the sun. It's preserved <coughs> and directed by the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit gives life to the entire biophysical world. He gives human beings the gifts of rationality, organisation and creativity. He is actively at work restraining sin and keeping creation from falling into chaos. The great um, Dutch theologian and politician Abraham Kuyper saw this idea of common grace as vital to our collaboration with our non-Christian colleagues. Culture is not inherently evil, but perverted, distorted, exaggerated good. So the solution to the problem of Christianity and culture is not to withdraw from creation, in the anticipation of the coming new order in the future, but to convert and renew that creation in the present. Now, alongside God's common grace shown to all human beings, there is God's special grace shown towards God's people. Professor John Lennox, famous for his debates with atheists, will always, if he gets an opportunity in Q&A, refer to the fact that the Jews have continued to survive as a distinct people, as one of the major reasons for believing in God 
and in what the Bible has to say about God. Christian academics working in the humanities need to pay close attention to God's dealings with Israel. It's in the Old Testament that we find a work example of a vision for a good society on earth and an extended commentary on why that society was never realised. It's in the Old Testament that we find the two great commandments, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, and to love our neighbours as ourselves. It's through the books of the law and the historical books that we see that human success does not consist in having all the horses, wives and wealth that Solomon had. It does not consist in military conquest or increases in GDP. Human success is about holiness, about knowing God, about acting rightly towards one's neighbours, and about paying particular attention to those suffering from material or relational deprivation. If you're looking for them in the Old Testament, they are characterised and typified as the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner. Creation. Four, God's providence through common grace to all humanity, God's particular grace towards Israel. And then the redemption. The Bible is not a self-help book. The Ark of the Old Testament leads to the point of recognition that the establishment of a godly society in Israel is impossible. In Jeremiah's memorable words, for people who've been doing evil to start doing good is as impossible as a leopard changing its spots or an Ethiopian changing the colour of his skin. Rescue, redemption, salvation has to come from the outside. So it comes through the incarnation. If you want to know what it's like to be made in the image of God, the incarnation is the answer. The incarnation is a demonstration that it is not inappropriate for God to become a human being. That is an extraordinary elevation of human dignity. By all the parts of human life that he came into contact with at any time. And Jesus' ministry tells us that God cares about physical needs as well as spiritual needs. He began his ministry by quoting from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. What Jesus' hearers would have heard him say was that he was promising freedom for those who were being held in physical chains that he was promising restoration of physical sight to the blind and food for those who were starving. Go away and do your Bible search and you will find that Jesus did all of those things. Now Jesus made it clear that human beings' most important need is the restoration of their relationship with God, but he also addressed natural human needs as well with real practical responses. But the redemption came to its culmination in the cross and in the resurrection. The cross telling us that sins are forgiven, that relationships are restored, that creation is to be renewed. And the resurrection telling us that death has been defeated and that God has the power to keep all God's promises. The Scottish Enlightenment atheist philosopher David Hume set out an argument against miracles which was designed to make them impossible a priori. C.S. Lewis famously responded to that in his little book, Miracles. In that book, he describes the incarnation as the grand miracle. But it seems to me that Lewis really gets to the crux of the matter when he turns in his chapter, Miracles of the New Creation, to the resurrection. Christianity depends on the big miracle, the unexpected ending, what Tolkien called the new catastrophe. So instead of the Surprising disaster no one was anticipating. The amazing rescue that could not be foreseen. It's the resurrection which is the definitive confirmation that God has the power to do all that God has promised. That the birth of Jesus in the stable was the incarnation of the Son of God. That the verdict of the human authorities that Jesus was a fraud and a liar 
was to be overturned on appeal. I'm a lawyer, I can't help using that imagery. The Apostle Paul made it absolutely clear in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. But the flip side of that is if Christ has been raised, then he really is at the <coughs> centre of creation. God has the power to raise Christ from the dead and God has the power to create the universe in all its vastness in a more intricate, microscopic and subatomic detail than the miracles recorded in Scripture are well within God's power. And that takes us on to the third bit of providence, the church. God's faithfulness <coughs> to the church. Christians living in the light of the redemption that Christ has accomplished and in anticipation of a consummation of Christ's victory. And so we have a mission as a people, and we have a mission as individuals to witness to the God who saved Israel and has saved the whole world in Christ. To model that restoration of relationship, to care for creation in accordance with that mandate we were given at the beginning, and to depend on God. And we do so with the promise that just as God was faithful to Israel, so God will be faithful to the church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. So to the final chapter of the story. The future hope. The outcome of history, the future reign of God, is assured because of what God has done in Christ. Perhaps taking his cue from Einstein's theory of relativity, Oliver O'Donovan puts it this way. It is only from within the perspective of our time frame that anything remains to be accomplished at all. Christ's triumph is complete, and in that event, humankind has been brought into the presence of God's glory. Nothing remains to be added to what has been done. We only wait for the fullest sight of it. Now, whilst we wait, there are two opposite dangers to be avoided. One is over-realized eschatology, the hubris that says we can anticipate heaven on earth now. The other one is apocalyptic resignation, which basically says, well, it's all going to be fine in the end, uh, but basically it's thoroughly messed up till then, so there's nothing we can do. Odysseus, on his way home from the war in Troy, found himself between Scylla and Charybdis. On the one hand, trying to do too much, and they're falling into inevitable disillusionment and disappointment when all our efforts fall short. On the other hand, not bothering to do anything at all. Futility, one of the seven deadly sins, the sin of despair. So Christianity tells a very different story from the narratives of modernity about what it means to be human, about what counts as human success, and what the world is like. The most successful stories in culture are not are ones which are not wholly false. They identify genuine human needs and promise to fulfil them in particular ways. We need to be aware of those stories and to live in the light of a different story. What C.S. Lewis calls a true myth. A big story about creation and the fall. About God has cared for the world as a whole and for Israel in particular. About the depth and the breadth of the redemption Christ has won, about God's providential care for the church and his mission, and the future hope that we have. Challenge for us as Christian scholars is to live all of our lives, including our scholarship, under, from within, and on the basis of that story.